Hey, it's my pleasure today to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Ed Barnes. Ed has somewhat of a unique trajectory that brings us here to the University of Washington ECE department today. He got his bachelor's uh, from Cornell and his PhD from UC San Diego in physics, and actually uh, his PhD was in the, in the area of string theory. Then through a series of research positions, he moved from string theory to condensed matter theory to quantum information. And now he's a professor at Virginia Tech, where his research portfolio includes um, quantum control technologies, quantum algorithms for near-term simulations of chemistry problems, and also generation of entangled photon states for secure communication. Um, so uh, and today he's going to talk to us about going toward the next quantum revolution, controlling physical systems, and taming decoherence. Let's welcome Ed. So thank you very much for the, the warm introduction and for the invitation to visit. I've had many really lively and interesting discussions during the visit, and I really appreciate uh, um, your hospitality. So today I want to talk about um, some of this uh, research related to quantum information science, and in particular, how you deal with one of the main problems to realizing pretty much all quantum information technologies, which is this idea of decoherence, which basically is the unwanted coupling between your quantum system which has your quantum information stored on it and its environment, which can be you know, a host of different types of environments, many different things can, can act as an environment. But that coupling eventually leads to the loss of that information stored in your quantum system. And people are trying really hard to figure out ways to slow down that process. And I'm gonna describe for you some of the techniques that people use and some techniques that I've developed myself to, to deal with this problem. So before I get into this decoherence problem and and ways you combat it, I want to say, first of all, a bit more about quantum technologies in general. So why do we care about quantum information technologies in the first place? There are a number of different reasons, depending on who you talk to, and what department they're in, and what their research background is. So some of the things that people tell you are, are the following. So first of all, information itself is physical. You can't separate information from the object, the, the physical or, you know, the system that contains the information, you can't separate it at the end of the day from the information itself. So the foundations of computer science, things like Turing machines and universality, ultimately depend on the laws of physics. So that's one motivation. Another one has, is, has a more technological flavor to it, this idea of Moore's law and the fact that it's you know, gradually coming to an end. If you want to build ever smaller devices, eventually quantum mechanics takes over, it, after all rules the behavior of physical systems on really small scales, and it's really inevitable that you have to deal with quantum mechanics if you want to keep scaling things down further and further. Now, there are also problems that people believe are just inherently intractable uh, on supercomputers. Even the world's best supercomputers are incapable of really handling these problems. And there are some indications that a quantum computer could potentially solve these problems in reasonable amounts of time. So some of these problems include, maybe the most famous one is the factorization of large numbers, which is, which is the underlying uh, mechanism behind today's cryptography for the internet and most things. It's based on the inability to, to factorize very large integers efficiently. And there are also many important problems that involve strongly interacting systems um, that you cannot easily simulate on a classical machine, but you could simulate them on a quantum machine uh, if it was uh, had the right structure to it. And there are problems in a number of areas, including nuclear physics, material science, quantum chemistry, which are already running into the, 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 the problem that supercomputers just aren't good enough to handle these kinds of problems. And then many body quantum dynamics, quantum simulation, how do, you, how do you describe a system that's evolving dynamically in time, which is described by quantum mechanics itself? This is a really challenging problem to, to treat on classical machines. But a quantum computer is kind of naturally designed to handle these kinds of problems because it's built on quantum mechanical systems uh, in its foundation. And then lastly, I mentioned that quantum mechanics can also potentially revolutionize the way we do communication security. So not just how we store information on a, on, on a machine and process it, but how we transmit it from one point on Earth to another. And there are 
principles in quantum mechanics that can essentially guarantee that you can do this transmission of information with 100% security. There's no way an eavesdropper can intercept that message without you knowing about it. So I'm not going to talk too much about this last point, but it is a, a large portion of my research. So, so the existing quantum technologies that people have been focused on over the last couple of decades are, can largely be grouped into three or four categories like this. There's quantum computing, where you imagine you build a machine that's made of quantum bits. I'll say in a moment what I mean by that. And then you can imagine running all kinds of different algorithms on this machine to factorize large integers or to do other interesting things. And people are still developing algorithms for such machines. Um, and then there's this idea of quantum communication that I just mentioned. You can use the principles of quantum mechanics to do secure communication along across big distances. Um, in uh, the last two years, uh, I'd say like the, the most cutting edge result that uh, has come out is this launching of a Chinese satellite that was able to, to transmit information from a point in China to a point in, uh, in Austria. So this is the largest distance quantum communication channel that has been uh, experimentally verified. And then there are also ideas for using quantum mechanics to enhance the sensing um, abilities uh, of various techniques to increase the sensitivity of measuring, say, electric fields or magnetic fields uh, in systems. And so the number of the, the um, possible applications to all of this include things like cryptography, simulating um, complex problems, secure communication, and so on. There are many other um, applications that people have come up with. So in this talk, I'm going to focus mostly on this uh, quantum computing branch, um, although some of what I will say also has applications to these other areas as well. It's quite, it's quite broad, because decoherence matters for all of these at the end of the day. So in quantum computing, the most uh, basic way to, to think about it is you're replacing a classical bit, which you know one way to, to realize a classical bit in a classical machine is to have a capacitor, which is either charged or uncharged. And then you, you, you call these 0 or 1, and they form the basic information building block of your classical machine. In a quantum computer, you want to replace this with some quantum mechanical system. And perhaps the simplest one is to use the spin of a single electron. So fundamental particles in nature have this intrinsic property called spin, which you can think of as being like a little bar magnet. And so you can think about the electron as either pointing up or pointing down corresponding to the orientation of this little bar magnet. But the weird thing about quantum mechanics is that you can have not only the one configuration or the other, but you can have what's called a superposition of the two. You can be simultaneously in both with some probability of measuring the one or the other when you do a measurement. So this is called superposition. And if you want to imagine encoding the information of a bit in this electron spin, you can say spin down means zero and spin up means one. But quantum mechanics tells you that you can have both 0 and 1 at the same time on this quantum bit, unlike the classical bit, which is either 0 or 1, and there's nothing in between. So this idea of superposition is one of the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics that give quantum computers and other quantum technologies their power. So in addition to this idea of superposition, some other principles of quantum mechanics include entanglement, which is when you bring two quantum particles or quantum systems together, they can be in certain configurations in which you cannot describe each system individually. They're described by, by a combined uh, configuration that you cannot, you cannot divide into, into separate descriptions of the individual systems. And then the last basic property of quantum mechanics that plays a big role in all of these technologies is the idea of what happens when you measure a quantum system. So if you're in a superposition like this and you do a measurement, the measurement, well, the measurement always gives you either 0 or 1. It never tells you you're in a superposition. So you always collapse the state of the system when you do a measurement. And on the one hand, that might seem like a nuisance because it makes it difficult to extract the information from a superposition like this. You can't directly measure alpha and beta in this superposition with a single measurement. But it also ends up being a really powerful tool in, in how you control quantum systems. You can do all kinds of interesting information processing using this collapse of the, of the quantum wave function. So these three concepts from quantum mechanics have already fundamentally changed the way that we think about information. And since nature is built on quantum mechanics, and nature ultimately determines the way that information is stored and can flow, these principles you know, are really critical to understanding information at its core. So here's a, a rough 
uh, overview of the current situation in quantum computing. Here I'm just focusing on matter-based qubits, so qubits that are realized in materials or some solid state device. And currently, some of the, the big players include IBM. They have a 50 qubit processor, so 50 of these qubits all coupled together and, and working. <clears throat> Google has a, a big device they call Bristlecone, which has 72 qubits. And then there's a company called IonQ, where they have 53 qubits. So these two devices are built from what are called superconducting qubits. These are small circuits which are brought down to really cold temperatures so that they behave quantum mechanically. And then there's a way in which you can encode a, a qubit of information in, in these circuits. So that's what these two are built upon. I'm not going to go into the details of those physical systems. This last one is built on, <clears throat> is built on what are called trapped ions, where you take individual ions and you trap them in a vacuum, and you, you can somehow control the state of these individual ions using lasers or other techniques. Um, <clears throat> so an important fact about the current state of the art that people don't normally tell you is that even though you can build these big systems now, this, these results are, you know, just in the last five years or so, people can make tens of qubits on a chip and make them all working. Um, people don't know what to do with these machines. Because this is already too big to simulate on a classical computer, so if you want to figure out how you should run an algorithm on one of these machines, it becomes a really challenging problem. Um, and so this really becomes a, a problem about control. So how do you actually go and understand, how do you go in the, into the system and drive the qubits in the, in the way that you want to get the outcome that you want, to implement the algorithm that you want? So that is a challenging problem. And in all these cases, decoherence, the coupling between these devices and their environment is still a major hurdle to overcome that really keeps people from really taking these machines and doing things you can't do with a classical computer. So even though you see articles about these devices in the New York Times fairly often, they don't tell you that, okay, these are nice, but nobody knows what to do with them. So this is a, <clears throat> a part of my research. Here's an overview of the stuff I work on. I may mention, you know, roughly the kind of the landscape of problems I work on. Um, most of these are, are related to quantum information science in one form or another. But the corner of my research I'm going to focus on to today has to do with this quantum control problem. How do you control systems of many qubits all coupled together in a way that keeps the environment from doing harm too quickly? And I'm going to focus in particular on a, on a type of qubit called um, spin qubits, which are built on this idea of using single electron spins as your uh, information storage object. And in particular, I'm going to focus on spin qubits and systems called semiconductor quantum dots. <clears throat> so first, let me say a little bit more about spin qubits. So first, let me say that a qubit, you know, intrinsically, a qubit is a two-level quantum system that you're replacing a classical bit with so that you can have a superposition of 0 and 1. But just having such a system is not enough. I mean, after all, in this room, this room is full of electrons. All these electrons have spin. But it's not enough to have the qubits. I need to be able to control the qubits in a precise way. And I can't do that with the electrons in this room unless I do something very special. So a real qubit is not just a two-level system, but it's one that I can initialize. I can put it in what state I want at the beginning of my computation. I can systematically rotate it to perform logical operations like I do in a classical machine. So I can do things like not gates or swap gates or or gates. I need a way to read out the result at the end. I need to measure the spins so I can extract the information at the end of my calculation. And it's not enough to just be able to control individual qubits. I need the qubits to talk to each other so that I can create quantum entanglement and do really interesting things. It turns out that most algorithms that people know about assume some amount of entanglement is created during the computation, like in this factorization algorithm. And that entanglement only happens if the qubits talk to each other. So I need to be able to bring these qubits together and allow them to talk to each other while being able to also do these other things at the same time. And only if I can do all of these will I say I have a real qubit. So there are many types of spin qubits that people have uh, realized in the laboratory and, and shown that they can satisfy these criteria. So here's a spin qubit in the form of a phosphorus donor in silicon. People can use either the, the electron spin that lives on this donor or they can use the nuclear spin that lives on it. And people have demonstrated all of these properties for this system. This is an example of a molecular spin qubit, where this is a big molecule consisting of, of around 100 atoms. 
but it has a net magnetic moment, and people can use that magnetic moment as a qubit. This is also an area I work on. And then a third category of spin qubits are these um, quantum dot spin qubits, where you find a, a way to trap single electrons in a small region on the surface or the, or the interface of a semiconductor. And then by using either magnetic fields or electrical voltages, you can control that spin. So in all of these systems, and in every other system uh, people are using for quantum information technologies, decoherence still remains perhaps the biggest challenge. So here are more pictures of semiconductor quantum dots. So here, the, this is a device from the Delft group uh, that they um, produced back in 2016. So here you have three quantum dots all in close proximity. So what happens here is they take two types of semiconductor and they put them together. And if they choose the semiconductors appropriately, then electrons kind of pool at the interface and they can move freely in this two-dimensional interface. And then they put these bits of metal on one surface here. And by tuning up the voltages on these bits of metal, they can create an electrostatic field that confines individual electrons in a small region of, of the size of a few, maybe 100 nanometers, maybe a little bit less, depending on the system. So here, the, in this experiment, they tuned up these, uh, these gates to create three little pockets here, and they can trap an, a, one electron in each pocket, so they have a three qubit device when they do that. Three electron spins, all trapped. And they can systematically prepare the state of each of these spins. They can rotate the spins any way they want, and they can read them out. So here's a five quantum dot device from Taruta's group in Tokyo, and they, they've demonstrated similar um, uh, similar control over the system. And then I think the, maybe the, the record in the world at the moment is this nine quantum dot device by Jason Pettis' group at Princeton. Um, and in this experiment, they were able to show that they could put one electron in this first quantum dot, and then by systematically tuning the voltages on these gates, they could shuttle the electron down the chain all the way to the end, and then bring it back to the beginning, which is a really impressive demonstration of control over their system. Unfortunately, I visited them a couple of months ago and this device um, suffered some, some bizarre fate. So it's, it was contained in a dilution refrigerator which brings the system down to a few tens of millikelvin, which is where most of these experiments are done at really low temperature. And then for this particular device, suddenly the, the refrigerator heated up overnight for no reason unexpectedly and so this, this experiment was kind of cut short. So they had many plans for what to do with this, but, but these things happen. So we can trap one electron in each dot. We can separate the spin up energy level from the spin down energy level by applying a constant magnetic field. We can rotate the individual spins with time dependent magnetic fields, which couple directly to the spin. So just by sending in a magnetic pulse, you can make the spin rotate any way you want. And then you can couple neighboring spins um, just by tuning these, these gates here. So if you allow this electron's wave function to overlap a little bit with this electron's wave function, they have a, an interaction between their spins. And that's the, exactly the kind of interaction you need to create entanglement, which is one of the main resources for quantum computing, as I mentioned. So these devices suffer from noise. And this noise comes from the interactions of the electrons with the environment. In the case of these quantum dots, the electrons interact with nuclear spins in the semiconductor, if the semiconductor is something like gallium arsenide that has spinful nuclei. And they also interact with electric field fluctuations in the system. Since the electrons are trapped by an, an electrostatic potential, if other charges are moving around on the, on the material, they're gonna change that potential and they're going to mess up how that electron spin interacts with other electron spins. And that's going to create a loss of information to the environment. So some noise sources are intrinsic to the material, like these nuclear spins in gallium arsenide. I can't get rid of them. They're just a property of the material. But some sources of noise are something I could hope to identify and eliminate, like charge noise in these systems. If I could somehow make a really clean sample and ensure that there are no additional charges beyond the ones I want to use as qubits, then I can totally eliminate this, this type of noise. So in practice, people have made a lot of progress in doing better materials and device designs to lower these kinds of noises. Um, but at the end of the day, 
just uh, improving the device is not sufficient. That's true in this case, that's true for pretty much every system. And what I'm gonna show you is that in addition to improving the device designs and the materials, you could do something that's kind of on the software end where by changing a little bit the way you control the system, you can, at the same time as you're trying to perform uh, a gate or an algorithm, you can decouple the, the qubit from its environment just by being a bit clever about how you drive it. So that's gonna be the main theme of the talk. So let's take a closer look at these noise sources for uh, semiconductor spin qubits. So I mentioned that there are nuclear spins in the case of gallium arsenide that interact with the electron. The way you would describe this two electron system is in the form of what's called the Hamiltonian, which is basically the, the object in quantum mechanics that tells you the energy of the system. So the electron spins interact directly with magnetic fields that gives rise to these first two terms. And then if the electrons are close enough, their wave functions will overlap, and that gives rise to a direct spin-spin coupling, which is called the exchange coupling. So this coefficient here, j, is a direct measure of how much these wave functions are overlapping with each other. And that in turn depends on how big your electrostatic barrier between the two electrons is. So that's something you can control just by changing voltages on your device. Now, since this barrier is electrostatic, if I have charge fluctuations in my system, that's going to change the electric field that the electron sees. And so that's gonna change this coupling a little bit by some amount delta j, which I don't know because it's, it's kind of a random fluctuation, so I can't predict what it's going to be. And in addition, the, the nuclear spins act like, the, like an effective magnetic field in addition to the one I apply to my system. And the nuclear spins are, you know, they're, they're quantum objects, they're constantly moving around and fluctuating, they don't stay static. And those fluctuations look like a magnetic field fluctuation seen by the electrons. And so that gives rise to effective magnetic field fluctuations, which also produces decoherence in my system. So for these spins in gallium arsenide, I have two main sources of decoherence. These are the two, charge noise and nuclear spin noise. And in order to make any progress, we need to understand how we can effectively remove this, these noises. So if we think about just a single electron spin interacting with a bunch of nuclear spins, the, the way you describe that system is in terms of this Hamiltonian. The details don't really matter for what I want to say. But essentially the important um, feature here is that there is a process in which your electron spin will flip with a nuclear spin. So if the electron's initially down and the nuclear spin is initially up, this can uh, evolve into a configuration where the electron is now up and the nuclear spin is down. So my bit of information is flipping as a consequence of this interaction with the environment. And the problem is that if I prepare my qubit in this superposition of zero and one, or up and down, if this flip-flop process, as it's called, happens a bunch of times, this nice superposition that I want to use for, as a quantum computing resource eventually evolves into something which is like a classical statistical mixture of one and zero. It's like all the quantum magic is gone. And in particular, the information stored on my qubit is lost. The information is stored in this superposition in the, in the form of this phase, for example. But it, through all these uh, flippings with nuclear spins, that information kind of diffuses into the nuclear spin bath and gets lost. And so in an experimental measurement of the amount of information on the qubit, this is the kind of thing that people see. So initially you have a lot of information, the signal is quite high, there's an oscillation because you have a magnetic field. But then over a short time scale, this information decays very quickly down to zero. And in this particular case, if you don't do anything, the decay happens on, the, on a scale of a few tens of nanoseconds. So then if you want to use this as a qubit in a quantum machine, whatever you want to do, you better do it within 10 nanoseconds, otherwise you're gonna lose the information before you have time to process it. So it's been known since the 1950s that you can do something a little bit clever <clears throat> to slow down this process of information loss or decoherence. And the idea is that if you send in pulses in the right way with the right spacing, then you can essentially decouple the spin from its environment. So you can imagine, so here are some famous sequences from the nuclear magnetic resonance community in which these, this idea first originated back in the 50s. 
So one approach is you can apply a fast pulse, a strong pulse, in the middle of some evolution period. Or you can apply many pulses with the right spacing. And all of these different sequences will achieve this decoupling of the qubit from its environment. And people have borrowed a lot of these ideas uh, for quantum information technologies. And they've demonstrated that they work OK. So here's an example for a phosphorus donor and silicon qubit. And you can see that when, when they applied one of these sequences, they were able to, to make the lifetime of the information on the qubit last longer and longer. So actually, they changed it by several orders of magnitude. And if you look at the time scale here, the decoherence time is on the scale of 35 seconds in this case. So compare that to the 10 nanoseconds I showed you in the previous slide. So you can actually you know, look at your watch and time how long the quantum information is surviving on this qubit by using these tricks. And these are other examples of other types of spin qubits where, pe where people have applied these techniques. This is an example of a spin qubit and a quantum dot like I've been talking about. This is an example of a spin qubit and a defect in a solid. This is an envy center uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with those defects. So let me give you a little bit of an idea of how this dynamical decoupling works. So let's take the simplest case where you just apply a single pulse halfway through the evolution time. So imagine that you start by orienting your electron spin along this vertical direction. And then you can apply a pulse, a magnetic pulse, for example, and rotate it to lie in this horizontal plane. And now imagine that I run this experiment multiple times. And every time I run the experiment, because I have this fluctuating magnetic field, the magnetic field is slightly different every time. But the magnetic field directly determines how quickly my electron spin precesses around the magnetic field. So if I, if I run the experiment multiple times and just plot what the spin looks like at a particular instant during the experiment for all these different experimental runs, this is the kind of picture I see. So in the first run, my spin is pointing over here. In the next run, since the magnetic field has changed, it's pointing over there. And then if my measurement consists of just taking all these experimental runs and averaging the result, that means I'm going to add all these vectors together. And in the end, it's going to basically cancel. They're going to basically cancel out, and there's not going to be anything left. And my information is lost. It's no longer there. But what people in NMR realized 60 years ago is that if you just, at this point in the evolution, just apply a really strong pulse, a pi pulse, to flip all of the spins around one, an axis in this horizontal plane, then you go from this configuration to this configuration. And now if you just wait, since all of these spins are still processing at, their, at whatever their precession frequencies were, at some later time, they're going to all just recoalesce along this direction here. Um, so this idea is basically just using you know, the, the, precession, the different precession frequencies of the electrons, if you just flip them all at the right time, they're just going to come back together. The fast ones will get there you know, at the same time as the slow ones, because uh, they're starting from further away after you do this pulse. So that's the idea of how you can elongate the lifetime of the information just by applying a single pulse. So the other pulse sequences do the same thing. And they have the same effect in the case where this fluctuation is essentially static during the experiment, during one run of the experiment. But you can also uh, look at what happens if you take into account the more realistic situation where the noise is actually constantly changing in time, at least by a little bit. And in this situation, these different pulse sequences no longer perform the same way. Some perform better than others. And the way you can understand how the lifetime of the information um, changes as a function of time is through what's called the coherence function. So the important thing here is you, know, you want this thing to be one. That means that you have all your information still there. And the smaller this gets, the more information has been leaked out into the environment. And what this function depends on is the noise power spectrum, how much noise there is at each frequency. And it depends on a function that just is determined by whatever pulse sequence you're sending into the system. It's called the filter function. Roughly speaking, it's the, the Fourier transform of the integral of your pulse sequence. So the idea is that if you can kill this integral, then you can, you can elongate the lifetime of the information. And what you need to do then is to find a filter function which is kind of perfectly anti-correlated with the power spectrum so that this integral evaluates to zero. 
or at least something very small. So then by tweaking your pulse sequence, you can, you can achieve that given some noise power spectrum. Here are the filter functions for these various different NMR pulse sequences I showed you in the, on one of the previous slides. And you can see that at certain frequencies, they have uh, strong drops. So then you want to try to align these dips in the filter function with the peaks of the power spectrum to make the, the information last as long as possible. And then here's an example with 1 over F, 1 over frequency noise uh, for these different pulse sequences. And you can see that, indeed, this technique works um, as as you use more and more sophisticated pulse sequences, you can make the, the information last longer and longer. So we use these ideas in collaboration with uh, an experimentalist named Charlie Marcus at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. He works with um, spins in quantum dots in gallium arsenide. And in addition to this, uh, he has, so he has nuclear spin noise like I talked about. He has charge noise as I talked about. And these noises are mostly concentrated at low frequency. So these dynamical decoupling techniques work extremely well if the frequency of the noise, if the noise is concentrated at small frequencies. But there also turns out to be, as we, as we realized, there's also a high frequency component of the noise in gallium arsenide coming from the fact that the nuclear spins themselves precess in the presence of a man magnetic field. And it turns out that this creates noise at high frequencies, which are basically related to the the differences of the precession frequencies of nuclear spins. And in gallium arsenide, there are three different isotopes of nuclei. And so these precession frequencies, the differences are non-zero. And so you get noise at high frequencies. But what we found is that when you apply these dynamical decoupling pulses, um, the performance depends dramatically on how far apart these pulses are spaced. So here's a picture of essentially the, the lifetime of the information stored on the qubit as a function of the applied magnetic field and as a function of the spacing between the pulses. And what you can see is that there are certain, um, for a fixed magnetic field, there are certain values of the pulse spacing where the lifetime suddenly gets increased by a lot. And so what we're seeing is that if you, if you just tune your driving appropriately, you can basically cancel out this high frequency noise. So a picture, a way to think about it is your noise spectrum looks something like this. There is this slow noise, which behaves roughly like 1 over f um, down here, which will be more or less taken care of for any spacing of the pulses. But you also have this high frequency component coming from the precession of the nuclear spins. And if you choose your pulse sequence so that the dips in the filter function line up with these spikes in the power spectrum, then you can totally remove the effect of this precession. And so that you get this dramatic improvement in the coherence time, the lifetime of the information stored on the qubit. And actually, we were able to achieve a record lifetime for these spin qubits in gallium arsenide using this technique. So in this case, this was um, almost a, a millisecond. So that's nuclear spin noise. Yes, question. So is it a, um, is it a predetermined? Uh, frequency then that you derive from the physical properties of the device, or is it something that you tune up on a device by device? Um, so in this particular case, so the question is, is this is this uh, frequency of the noise something that's predetermined, or does it depend on the device? So in this case, the noise, uh, this high frequency noise, comes just directly from the precession of the nuclear spins, which is an intrinsic property to these nuclear spins. And so it just depends on the mag magnetic field that I apply. So I know exactly what that frequency is. So then I can always tune up the pulse sequence to exactly cancel that frequency. But there are other situations where it's less clear where the bulk of the noise is in frequency space. And that's more challenging to figure out. Um, I, I can say more about that. But, uh, let me... So we also have charge noise to deal with. And charge noise is perhaps comparable to nuclear spin noise. In some systems, it's actually the dominant noise source. It's actually the main noise source in all spin qubits and semiconductors. It's the main noise source in superconducting qubits. Pretty much all solid state systems suffer from charge noise. And in most systems, people don't know where it comes from. In the case of uh, these um, spin qubits in gallium arsenide or in other semiconductors like silicon, the spectrum has been measured to be something like 1 over frequency. Um, that's basically just an experimental result. People don't really understand where it comes from. And in a double quantum dot system where I have two electrons that talk to each other because they're close and their wave functions overlap, 
I can express that system using this Hamiltonian, this energy operator, in the following way. So there, you know, on one, I can describe it by this two by two matrix, where in the diagonals I have the exchange coupling and the fluctuations in that, in that coupling. And then the, on this off diagonal, I have the difference in the magnetic field seen by the two electron spins and the fluctuations coming from the nuclei. So one problem, so in, in these experiments, both types of noise are there and they're kind of comparable to each other. And one difficulty that we ran into immediately is that if you want to understand what pulse sequences do in the presence of two noise sources, you have to do something new because nobody had really solved this problem yet. So in the example I showed you previously where I just worried about nuclear spin noise, we were able to kind of borrow some existing, this existing um, um, construct in terms of this filter function and, and power spectrum that was worked out by other people. But when you have two or more noise sources acting at the same time, people had not worked out something analogous in that situation. So I worked on this problem, again, in collaboration with Charlie Marcus at, at Copenhagen. And the challenge here is that you can't solve the Schrodinger equation for the qubit, you know, the basic equation that governs how a qubit evolves in time, when you have two types of noise at the same time. But what I realized is that in this system and in most other systems, the bulk of the noise is happening at low frequency. So you can invoke what's called the adiabatic theorem, which is a theorem that, that tells you how a quantum system evolves in time if the evolution is slow. So the details don't matter, but the important point is that by noticing that the noise is slow, I can invoke this adiabatic theorem and solve the Schrodinger equation to understand how my qubit is evolving in time. And then, so you can make the assumption that the noise is slow, and then you can solve the Schrodinger equation, and then you can go back at the end and decide, was it a good approximation? There's actually a very clear criterion to tell when it's a good approximation. And there's a condition you can work out on the noise spectrum that tells you if this is a reasonable thing to do. And it turns out that for both noise, charge noise and nuclear spin noise in these systems, this condition is satisfied uh, quite easily. And then you can take the theory that comes out of it and compare it to experiment, and you can see that over a wide range of spin-spin couplings, you get really good, a good agreement. So the theory works quite well. So then we took this theory, and we used it to show that there is something else you can do in the system to slow down the loss of information to the environment. And um, the, the idea is to try to keep the system in what's called a sweet spot for as long as possible. So typically in quantum systems, if you tune up the, the parameters right, you know, the couplings and the, maybe the fields you use and so on, you can oftentimes find a, a spot in parameter space where the system is just less sensitive to noise compared to other points in parameter space. And for this double quantum dot system with two electrons, the way that people have been controlling the exchange couplings just by kind of tilting the electrostatic potential where you just raise one dot and lower the other one, the energy of one, lower the other one. So you do this sort of tilting, as people call it, to change the interaction between the two electrons. But what we said is that you should not do that, even though that's what people have been doing for a decade. Instead, you should try to keep the system in a symmetric configuration as much as possible, because it turns out that this is less sensitive to noise, charge noise in particular. And then instead, instead of doing this tilting thing, you should instead just raise and lower the barrier by applying a voltage to some to some metallic gate in between the quantum dots. And if you do that, you can extend the lifetime of the qubit by a factor of five or so. And then using the theory I developed by the, with this generalized filter function thing where you treat multiple noise sources at the same time, we were able to show that indeed this, this idea works. And so actually we use this technique in conjunction with this, this timed pulse thing to take care of the high frequency nuclear noise to get the record coherence times that I showed you in the previous slide. So just by fooling around with how you control the system, you can change the lifetime of a qubit by orders of magnitude. In this case, maybe four orders of magnitude altogether. Can you use Question. both tilt and sim? Can you use both of those properties to, to actually improve even more? Or is tilt just useless once you, not, once you do sim? So, so the idea is that the way people had been doing it was using tilt. But it turns out that tilt is more sensitive to charge noise. So instead of using tilt, we're proposing that you use this symmetric operation scheme where you always keep the two dots kind of symmetric to each other at the same energy level and just raise the barrier instead. 
So it's really symmetric instead of the tilt. And now people, basically all the groups doing quantum dot spin qubits are using this symmetric approach now. So, and what I've described so far, I've talked about just preserving the information on the qubit for as long as possible by just fooling around with how we control it, by sending in extra pulses, by changing, changing the, by maintaining a certain configuration of the system. But we don't want to just preserve information, we also want to process it. And processing it means you're doing gates on it. You're doing things like a NOT gate or an OR gate. And in quantum mechanics, what that means is you're shaping what's called the evolution operator. So this is a time-dependent matrix that tells you how some initial quantum state will look at a later time. And this evolution operator is itself determined by the Schrodinger equation, which looks like this. So the time derivative of this matrix is equal to minus i times this Hamiltonian, which just depends on the system in question, uh, acting on this evolution operator. So it's a differential equation for a matrix. And given a Hamiltonian, I can solve for that evolution operator and know how an, an initial quantum state was going to look at a later time. For a qubit, the Hamiltonian is just a two by two matrix. There's some energy splitting on the diagonal here. That's the difference between the spin up and the spin down. And then there's a driving term. This could be a time dependent magnetic field that rotates spin up to spin down. So this is how I describe a driven qubit. And really any driven qubit could be described this way, not just a spin qubit. So the idea behind quantum control is I want to reverse engineer this equation. I want to figure out what my Hamiltonian should look like, in particular what the driving should look like, so that I achieve the evolution operator I want. And the evolution operator is the gate. So it's the analog of a not gate. Actually, there is a not gate in quantum mechanics. So if I want to design a not gate, that means I need to design a particular evolution operator. And so I need to find a driving field which will achieve that evolution operator at some particular time. So that's what I mean by quantum gate. And then, of course, you build up algorithms by applying many different gates in sequence, very much like you do in a classical computer. So how do we systematically find good driving fields, good control fields, to achieve various kinds of gates that we want with very high precision, despite the presence of noise? So here's the Hamiltonian for a qubit. It's a two by two matrix. It depends on time, because I have some driving field. Let's call it J of T in general. And then there's some constant field, like a magnetic field, let's call it H. This could describe any qubit I like. It could be a spin qubit. It could be some other kind of qubit. So depending on the physical system you're using to realize the qubit, these different quantities have different physical interpretations. So J could be a magnetic field. It could be some energy splitting you can tune. It really just depends on the system you're interested in. But all these things are described by the same math. So I can just solve them all at once. And the environment gives rise to fluctuations in this Hamiltonian. It can fluctuate this constant h. It can fluctuate this driving term j. And I need to somehow achieve a target evolution operator, which is my gate, in such a way that it's robust to these fluctuations, at least to first order, maybe to higher order as well. So you can try using techniques from nuclear magnetic resonance. They work in a few special cases, but in general, they don't work very well. Part of the reason is because qubit systems have different sorts of physical constraints that, are not, that uh, don't arise in NMR. And so a lot of the techniques from NMR don't carry over very well to qubits and in quantum information. So this was pointed out to me by some of my experimental colleagues, and they asked me, well, NMR techniques don't work. Can you find something else that works so I can create a gate in my system in a robust way? And the first thing I did with uh, collaborators at the University of Maryland, where I was for a while, we came up with square pulse sequences that respect all the constraints of the qubit. In this case, this is a spin qubit and a quantum dot. And then I went happily to Harvard to work with my experimental collaborator. And he tried simulating, he, not simulating, he, he tried implementing this in the laboratory. It sort of worked, but it wasn't great. And ultimately, what he told me is that, OK, square pulses are, I can understand they're nice mathematically because it's easy to solve the Schrodinger equation in this case. But experimentally, they're very nasty because I can't, you know, I can't, I can't ramp up my field infinitely fast and then just make it stop and stay flat for a long time and then bring it back down infinitely fast. 
In reality, the pulse that reaches my qubit is something much more, much deformed from this. And so I'd like it very much if you could instead give me something smooth, nice and smooth, that does the same thing. Can you do that? And that was challenging because the whole reason that we use square pulses is because it's easy to solve the Schrodinger equation. It's easy to work out the evolution operator and what Hamiltonians we need to use to realize that evolution operator. And if you take away my square pulses, suddenly I don't have all those, all those analytical tools I can use. Nobody knows how to solve the Schrodinger equation in general, even for our qubit, the smallest quantum system. So what do you do? Well, what I did is I thought about the simplest case first. Suppose I have a qubit that has a drive, one driving field here and then just has noise along some other direction. This could be like nuclear spin noise. And J here could be a magnetic field I'm using to rotate my spin. But this is a general situation. It could describe any qubit system. And what I noticed is that you can expand the evolution operator perturbatively and try to solve this differential equation for it using perturbation theory. It turns out that the coefficients in this perturbation expansion satisfy kind of a weird recursion relation where the previous one determines the next one all the way down. The weird thing is that if you take the first order coefficient, so the first order noise term in this evolution operator, and you, it's a complex function of time because quantum mechanics is basically uh, a theory about complex functions. You can plot it in the complex plane, you know, the, to plot the, make the real part, the horizontal axis, the imaginary part, the vertical axis. And this coefficient here at first order is going to trace out some curve in this plane as time progresses. Now, the really weird thing that I still don't totally understand to this day is that if you look at a particular point along this curve and look at the curvature of that curve, defined in the way that mathematicians define it, where you, you draw a circle that has the same uh, kind of curvature at that point and then look at the inverse radius of that. That's how mathematicians define the curvature of a curve. It turns out that the curvature of this curve is the driving field I'm applying. That sounds really simple, but it's actually a very profound statement because now I can start drawing curves and I know exactly what driving fields achieve this evolution just by reading off the curvature. And what I'm plotting here is the first order noise error. I want the noise to vanish at the end of my gate. So what I should do then is draw closed curves. So here I start at the origin. As time progresses, I trace out some curve here. And then I just come back to the origin. I could draw any closed curve I like. I'm basically drawing the error on my qubit. So if it comes back to 0, I'm guaranteeing that the error is going to be 0 at the end. But then the problem is, well, how do I know what pulse I should use to achieve that evolution? Well, I just told you, you can just read it off from the curvature. I can systematically draw any curve I like and read off the curvature just by using some mathematical formula for it. So it turns out that uh, the quantum gate you implement depends on the opening angle at the origin. So if I want to rotate my spin by this angle, in a way that's insensitive to fluctuations in the qubit energy splitting, I just draw closed curves that have this opening angle at the origin. Any closed curve that has the same opening angle will achieve, will give me a pulse that's robust to first order. And this is a, the general solution to this problem. So any pulse which achieves robust evolution corresponds to one of these closed curves. So here's an example of a closed curve. Here's the pulse that comes out. If you draw a nice smooth curve, you get a nice smooth pulse, since the pulse is just the curvature. If you want to get different quantum gates, you need to draw curves that have different opening angles. Here are four different curves that have different opening angles. Reading off the curvature, I get four different pulses that implement different quantum gates that are robust to first order. I'll come back in a second and explain what the word lemnus gate means, which I learned when I was doing this research. So you can go back. So this is supposed to be totally general. So I can go back to NMR and ask, well, all those pulse sequences from NMR, what do they look like in this language? If you look at spin echo, where you just apply a single pulse halfway through the evolution, that corresponds to a line in this plane. Start at the origin. Oh, sorry. Yeah, start here at the origin, come up, and then come back down. Since the curvature tells you the pulse, the curvature is 0 everywhere except the point where I turn around, where it's infinite, because I turn around infinitely fast. That's a delta function pulse. 
If I want to look at the fancier NMR pulse sequences where I apply a bunch of delta function pulses with some spacing, they all correspond to staying on the line and just going up and down some number of times. So long as you come back to the origin at the end, you're guaranteed the noise errors are canceled. Every time you turn around, you get a delta function. So that's all the NMR pulse sequences. So to get the full solution space, you have to get off the line and start drawing curves in two-dimensional planes. So that's canceling first order noise errors. What if you want to cancel second order noise errors also? What if the noise is a little bit stronger and you want to cancel it to second order? Now, weirdly enough, it turns out that the condition for that in terms of curves is to make sure the curve is not only closed so you cancel first order, but also make sure the area that's enclosed by the curve vanishes. That's the condition for making sure the second order noise error vanishes. So one way I can do that is I can draw figure eight shapes and since when I trace out this curve in time, up here I'm going anti-clockwise, down here I go clockwise. So there's a sign difference between the areas of these two lobes and that exactly cancels if it's nice and symmetric. So here are a bunch of figure eights. All of them, um, all of them give rise to pulses which cancel noise to second order. And again, every pulse which is insensitive to noise to second order is one of these uh, closed curves of vanishing area. So it's a general solution. Now it turns out that a lot of 19th century mathematicians spent a lot of time fooling around with their favorite figure eight curves. They called them lemnus gates for reasons I don't know. But a nice way to get nice pulses is to just, just take their favorite figure eights, their favorite lemnus gates, and just turn them into pulses. Question? Uh, how do you determine the time scale? How quickly do you move through these curves to determine the, the, the pulse function? <clears throat> yeah, so the question is how do you determine the time scale? So here the time scale is determined by the experimentalist. So I can rescale everything freely. So what happens in practice is my experimentalist friend tells me, I can make a pulse that has this high in amplitude, but I can't go above this amount. What that means is that I can't make my curvature too large. So I need to draw curves that don't bend too much. But that's not so hard. I can easily constrain the way I draw the curve so that doesn't get violated. Yeah, that's a good question. So all of these figure eights end up doing identity gates because they always have an angle of pi at the origin. If you want to do non-trivial gates, you need to do something a little bit less symmetric like down here, and then you get different quantum gates on your qubit while still canceling noise to second order. So why do we do all of this? Well, you know, I did this because my experimental colleagues told me they don't like square pulses, so in the end, can we actually see that, that benefit? And so we did a, a systematic analysis between these smooth pulses and square pulses, and indeed, it's the, if you take into experimental constraints on pulse forms, you, you can find orders of magnitude improvement over the, over the lifetime of the qubit um, as a consequence of using these shaped pulses. Now, an, an additional interesting thing I didn't mention yet is that the duration of the gate is equal to the length of the curve. So not only can I read off directly what the pulse looks like, I can also tell immediately how long it's going to take to implement the gate, just by looking at how long the curve is I drew. So that also tells me that I can systematically figure out what is the fastest possible pulse which will cancel noise to second order or whatever order I want, just by solving this constrained ge geometry problem. So you tell me what your maximum pulse amplitude is, I constrain my curvature, and then I try to find the smallest, the shortest curve that has a zero vanishing area without violating that curvature constraint. So this is a classic example of variational calculus. And so you can set up a variational calculus problem. You can write down um, this function that you need to minimize. And basically you're just putting in the length of the curve and the constraint on the curvature. And it turns out that this, that this uh, variational calculus problem has a really simple solution. Your curve is either made up of Straight, is made up of straight lines and circular arcs. And any combination of them can work. But anything else you do is not going to be optimal. It's going to cost you time. So the shortest ones that we could think of would have three segments at most. Uh, could, would have to have at least three segments, sorry. So you could have a straight line and then a circular arc and then a straight line. Or you could have a straight line and then two circular arcs to make a closed loop, which I want to cancel first order errors. Or I could also do it with three circular arcs all together. Those are the three options I could think of. Anything else requires more segments and more time. 
So then well, I just have three possibilities. So I can look at all three and I can compare their lengths systematically for every opening angle I'm interested in, which determines the quantum gate I care about. And it turns out that always the one with three circular arcs is the one that wins. So this is the unique global solution to this problem. Circular arcs mean constant curvature, which means square pulses. So this is what the pulse looks like for this optimal solution. That's at first order, I just I insisted on having a closed curve. But if I want to cancel second order noise as well, I need to have a closed curve that has zero net area. And I can again find the time optimal pulse that does it. I, I can set up the same variational calculus problem, just add in the additional constraint that the area vanishes. This is what the optimal solution looks like. You basically just add in another circle on top of the first order solution that I showed you previously. And since these are all circular arcs, you again end up with some sequence of square pulses. So this is the global solution in this, uh, in this problem. And you can work out exactly what these square pulses should look like for every quantum gate you want to look at. But I began this discussion by saying I don't like square pulses because my experimental friends don't like square pulses. So you can go and you can smoothen the square pulses and you can do it in such a way that you stay very close to the time optimal solution. Now you have two options when you do this. You could either take the square pulse that came out of this variational calculus problem and just try to smoothen the, the corners of that thing. Or you can go back to the curve you started with and try to smoothen that in such a way that the pulse that comes out is also smooth. It turns out that the second approach is by far the better approach. You want to smoothen the curve first and then translate it to a pulse rather than first find the pulse and then smoothen that thing out. Um, it can make orders of magnitude difference in how, in how robust your quantum gate is in the end. So, so this part was about this slightly simplified problem where I have driving on one axis of the qubit and noise along another axis. But more generally, I have a situation where I have also a constant term on the, on the other axis. So if I want to think about this as I'm driving the system with maybe a, a laser or I'm using microwaves, and the, the, for, the former case corresponded to driving resonantly of the qubit, and now I'm talking about driving off resonantly. So there's some non-zero detuning, which is what this H, you can think about uh, that is what H is. And we have fluctuations now both in H and in J in general. So this problem is qualitatively more difficult than the one I just talked about because I can no longer do perturbation theory in this problem. And the reason I can't do perturbation theory is because I can't even solve the zeroth order problem. Even without noise, I can't find the evolution operator for this Hamiltonian. So this is the oldest uh, dynamics, uh, quantum dynamics problem that uh, has been studied since 1932. And people have found very few examples of pulses for which the Schrodinger equation can be analytically solved. Even, so even though this problem has been around for 90 years, it's still largely unsolved. So there are a few special cases that people worked out. So in 1932, people showed if you have linear driving, there is a certain solution based on hyperbolic, uh, parabolic cylinder functions, which are nasty, but it's analytical still. If you choose the driving field to be a hyperbolic secant pulse, which looks like this bell-shaped curve, it turns out the Schrodinger equation becomes the hypergeometric equation, which people spent a lot of time studying in the 19th century. And so I can say things about the evolution based on that work. But other than these early results from the 1930s, you know, every decade or two, people come up with another special case where you can exactly solve the Schrodinger equation. But these are far too few to be useful for quantum information because, you know, I can't, I need to be able to come up with basically an infinity of possible pulses to give to my experimental collaborators. And if I want to cancel noise, I can't, there's no reason why these particular shapes should do it. And, then, and in fact, they don't. So the reason why there are so few is because the way that people solve the Schrodinger equation to find these examples, don't worry about the math details, the, the point here is that the Schrodinger equation is a second order differential equation where if you tell me the driving field, I can tell you the evolution operator or the wave function. It's just an ordinary linear second order differential equation. But to turn this, to get something analytical, I need to, what people typically do is they just pick a driving field so that this equation becomes something they recognize, something they saw in a math class at some point, something that had been studied by 19th century mathematicians. So as I said, 
If you choose the hyperbolic secant pulse, this becomes the hypergeometric equation, and people have studied that for you know, hundreds of years, so you can borrow those results to say what the quantum system is doing. We need something more systematic. So what I did was to take the same Schrodinger equation and instead think about it as an equation for the driving field itself. This is a nonlinear first order equation because I have a j squared over here and a one over j over here. It turns out you can still solve it analytically even though it's nonlinear. This is the solution. And then the basic idea is I decide what evolution I want, I plug into this formula and it tells me what the driving field is that achieves that evolution. And all of this is just to solve the zeroth order problem before I even put noise into it. But this is a general solution to the zeroth order problem. I can systematically find a, an infinitude of different pulses, all of which I can solve analytically. So I, I gave this problem to a high school student I worked with for a summer and he, his job was to just generate new pulses, new examples to add to that list I showed you dating back to the 1930s. Here are some of the examples he picked. So the idea here is that in quantum information, I don't necessarily care about being able to implement a particular pulse like a Gaussian in my system. I just want something that's maybe a bell-shaped curve or maybe something that oscillates nicely. It doesn't have to be a sine or a cosine, but it should oscillate nicely depending on the particular task I, I'm trying to, to accomplish. And that problem is easy. If I want a bell-shaped curve, I can easily find an analytical solution in that case. Not if it's a Gaussian, but if it's something that's like a Gaussian, it can work. So all these are examples of exactly analytically solvable solutions, driving fields that I can solve the Schrodinger equation for. So given this zeroth order approach, this zeroth order solution, I can now go back and add noise in, and I can figure out how I can cancel the noise. And after a year or two of algebra, what you find is that it looks a lot like what we had for the resonant driving case. So, so long story short, the bottom line is that whereas in the, off, in the resonant case we were drawing curves on a plane, when you want to drive off resonantly, now you're drawing curves in three-dimensional space that are not constrained to a plane. And the three-dimensional curve is specified by its curvature, which still tells you the pulse amplitude, but it also is specified by something called the torsion, which describes the twisting of the curve uh, at every point along the curve. And the torsion turns out to be directly related to the detuning of the pulse. So you can run the whole story through again, and every time you want to create a pulse that's robust to first order or second order, you just draw a closed curve in three-dimensional space and read off the curvature, read off the torsion to get the Hamiltonian that generates that, that gate that you want. <clears throat> so this turns out to be, uh, it comes back to the fact that the, it turns out the Schrodinger equation is related to a famous equation from the study of curves in mathematics called the frenet soray equation, and it seems like this connection has been largely unnoticed over the 90-year history of quantum mechanics. And it's basically what's responsible for this amazing uh, mapping between finding robust quantum gates and drawing curves in two or three dimensions. <clears throat> so in addition to creating new pulses, we can also use this technique to analyze pulses that people are already using in the lab. So in collaboration with uh, a group at the University of um, Sydney in Australia, we took the pulses they were using that were generated from numerical recipes and we analyzed what's wrong with them by mapping them to these curves. Um, so this is a collaboration with their group. So just to summarize, I've shown you how you can use um, pulse sequences to filter out the nuclear spin environment of a spin qubit and a quantum dot. I showed you a new approach to, to modeling multiple noise sources acting on a qubit at the same time. I've shown you a general solution for robust gate design. Um, and I think I've, hopefully I've convinced you that you can achieve fully optimized control over spins and other kinds of qubits. Um, and you can systematically figure out ways to, to combat noise and decouple the system from its environment that can extend the lifetime of the information stored in the qubit by orders of magnitude, just in the software level. And we're currently working to extend all these ideas to multi-level systems, many qubits coupled together. And uh, hopefully we'll have some results in that before too much longer. Thanks. So with that, I'd like to just uh, throw up my collaborators and funding slide and take any additional questions. Okay, since we ran slightly over, we'll take just one or two very short questions, and if you have longer questions, come up after the talk. <clears throat> 
We did have questions during the talk this time. OK, Aaron. Uh, is it obvious how to take these methods and scale them up to one of those big processors that you had? Um, do you treat each qubit as independent, or do they couple somehow? <coughs> Is that an easy question? <clears throat> yeah, so the question is, how do you scale this up to multiple qubits coupled together? And it's actually a really interesting question. On the one hand, um, basically the, the size of your quantum system determines the dimensions in which this curve lives. But what's really bizarre, at least to me, is that if you think about two qubits, if they're not entangled, then you could just draw two curves in three dimensions. But if they are entangled, you're talking about one curve in, say, nine dimensions, or actually 16 dimensions. So what I'm trying to figure out is how do you, how, do, how does entanglement relate to this whole story? And that's a, that's a really challenging question, but I think it's also really interesting. Okay, so let's uh, thank Ed one more time.